Snow, good afternoon. And everybody give yourself a hand for, for attending today. And my name is Philip Hosaurus, Rock and Poet Laureate, and I want to welcome you to the first annual Rockton Public Library celebrating poetry, honoring our educators. I am a student of Brockton. I attended the Perkins, Whitman, West Junior High, and Brockton High Schools. Even today, Brockton is teaching me important lessons. Deidre Smith invited me into her classroom so that her students could reignite the joy of literature and her students opened up and shared some deeply personal connections with each other, creating their original poetry. This is a teacher who loves and cares deeply about her students. Both my daughters are also students of Brockton, and because of what their teachers instilled in them, my daughters, Caitlin and Sarah, and I'm sure I'm going to get in trouble by mentioning their names, <laughs> now are teachers here in Brockton, caring and sculpting our children's future. This instilled an idea in me, and I turned to the director of the library, Paul Engel, there he is, <laughs> who, gave, who gave his approval, and I contacted Jason DeNoyes, where is Jason? He brought the idea to Mayor Sullivan, Councilman Winthrop Farwell, and Council President Jack Lally. I know they're here. <laughs> Superintendent of Schools Michael Thomas, all enthusiastically and proudly supported this undertaking. A special and well-deserved acknowledgement to Jonathan Stroud and his staff for the programs before you, the flyers and banner. Jonathan? So today, here in the Lingus Auditorium, named after Dr. John Lingus, who delivered me into this world many, many years ago, and let's leave it at that. So you could say, he was my first teacher. I am honored to celebrate not only poetry, but all literature, to shine a light on Brockton, our educators <clears throat> from the superintendent of schools, Michael Thomas, our teachers here today, my daughters, and all the teachers who make Brockton the city of champions. We are Brockton proud. Please welcome your host for the afternoon, Courtney Henderson, the last piece of this amazing journey. And let me tell you a little bit about Courtney. Courtney Henderson is a political strategist, community leader, and advocate for the youth in the South Shore area of Massachusetts. Since her move to Massachusetts back in 2016, Courtney has organized workshops for women with the Brockton area branch NAACP, as well as organized symposiums and community events with the South Shore chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority. Not only is Courtney a leader for the women in the NAACP committee, but she also serves as vice president and social action chair for her local chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho. Courtney is the founder and CEO of Develop and Empower Consulting, a campaign management and political <clears throat> relations boutique firm. Before her interest in women and youth, Courtney focused heavily on political issues such as voter participation and voter suppression. She has six years of experience working on campaigns and policy analysis. Courtney graduated magna cum laude from Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, earning her bachelor's in political science and Spanish, and earned a master's in international relations from Harvard University. Most recently, host of the NAACP's Brockton's Phenomenal Women Awards. Please give an enthusiastic welcome for Courtney Henderson. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I'm so bashful whenever someone reads my bio. <laughs> I don't like hearing it, but uh, all those things are very, very true. I want to um, thank you, thank the Brockton Public Library, and, and a special thank you to Jonathan and Phil. Uh, and Philip for uh, asking me to moderate this afternoon. My, I have a strong love for poetry, and doing this event reminds me of going to um, poetry out louds and poetry slams with my mother. Um, so it's a true honor to be here this afternoon, and it's a, such a delight to be amongst poets and poetry lovers. Um, so I hope that you all enjoy each um, person that we're gonna be highlighting. And it's very important because these people are, like. Like Philip said, these are boss Brocktonians. I, I'm not from Brockton, but I've done so much work here, and I know that there is so much talent and potential here. And I love that the library makes these platforms so that we can highlight these people. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be introducing um, the next person, uh, because we have on the program that um, someone from the mayor's office is speaking. OK. Um, so <laughs> yeah, no, come on. You're right on time. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, he's going to share some remarks from the mayor's office. Unfortunately, he can't be here today. He's a very busy man. <laughs> Good, afternoon, Good afternoon, everyone. Well, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for having us here at the mayor's office. Uh, for this remarkable, magnificent event today. And it is truly an honor. I have a special thank you to the Brockton Public Library. And also, Philip, thank you for organizing this. And, and Paul, and thank you for working uh, with the library and Philip to make this a reality. Uh, unfortunately, the mayor is not, here, is not able to come here due to a prior engagement, a conflict engagement. But here in the mayor's office, this is an honor for us to present official mayoral citations to our educators, also our local poets. And I'm truly honored to read them. And the language is the, is the same as well. Um, and this is from our Honorable Mayor Sullivan. It reads, Brockton, City of Champions, the Mayor's Office, be it known that the Mayor of Brockton hereby extends his appreciation to Ms. Melissa Renee Brown. So if your name, if I call your name, if you can come up. In recognition of your dedication to the art of teaching poetry and literature that reflects our diverse culture and serves to enhance the city of Brockton. Therefore, it gives me great pleasure pre to present this citation to you as a symbol of appreciation. This citation is duly signed by the mayor of Brockton, city of Brockton, on this day, the 30th of April, 2022. Signed by Robert F. Sullivan, Mayor of the City of Brockton. And so I'm going to call all the educators up, if you can kindly come. I have uh, Ms. Kate DeMarca. Congratulations. Ms. Josephine Farah. Uh, we have Dr. Fred Marchant. We have Mr. James, also known as Jim, James G.H. Moore. We have Ms. Meredith Nuzbum. <laughs> we
we have Ms. Deidre, Deidre yeah. Smith. <laughs> Thank you. And last but not least, we have Mr. Mark Welsh. Congratulations, Mark. I would like to ask the, uh, the educators if you can come here so we can take a group picture, please. Thank you. Are you sure you yeah. have everyone? Should we like make two layers? No, I just need to get two layers. There we go. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is really nice. Thank you very much. Congratulations. You guys are the city of champions. You guys are the champions in the city. Thank you. Next, I would like to bring up to the mic to um, have some remarks. It's Councillor Farwell. It's, it's a real privilege to be here and to be part of this ceremony. Um, I'd like to offer a couple of words about poetry and education. I think it's taken on an increasing meaning in our society. We are unfortunately reducing communications to tweets. Some people run government by tweets. <laughs> we have reduced communication between people to text messaging. We have reduced inter-office communications to email. I worked for a company once where my office was here and probably 25 feet down the hall with someone else and they would email me, I worked in human resources, would you bring in a leave of absence form for, a, for an employee instead of getting up and interacting with people the way we used to? And it's really a shame. So I think poetry, in my humble opinion, has become something that we really need to emphasize or I fear we are going to lose that connection between people because of this lack of communication. Uh, so. What effect has poetry had on me? I'll tell you a true story. Um, and I think I'm the oldest in the room. Philip's trying to pull rank on me, but <laughs> I'm going to go back 48 years to when I was a junior in high school. And my English teacher down in the Cape was Elizabeth Hooker. And Miss Hooker was very much into poetry. And one of the poems that she loved was by Richard Lovelace uh, to Althea in prison, while well, he was in prison. And her very best excerpt from that poem was, stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. So now fast forward to 2011. I completely ruptured my left quad tendon. I was in a chair for 12 weeks in a brace. And every night I felt trapped. I couldn't get up and do what I wanted to do. I couldn't take the dog out. I couldn't interact the way I wanted to. So I would shut my eyes and I would remember if stone walls do not a prison make, then I'm not going to let that injury confine me. And I would shut my eyes and I would dream about, we went to Florida with the kids. We went to San Francisco and rode the cable cars. Because if your mind and your spirit is free, then you are free. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of poetry. It is a privilege to be associated with all of you. And the educators, you're going to get a workout today because we have citations. <laughs> oh, yes, you're not going to get away that easy. We have citations. And to my left is Council President Jack Lally. He will be assisting me. We have citations from all of us on the City Council. They all read the same. And it reads, be it known that the Brockton City Council extends its congratulations for your dedication to teaching and advocating poetry and literature on behalf of the arts and culture of Brockton. And it's signed by Council President Lally, by me, and by the uh, city clerk. So with that said, Melissa Renee Brown, you're up again. <laughs> Yeah. 
Catherine DeMarca. Bridge the gap. Yep. Thank you. you know, it's funny when Jack and I go places, they think it's father and son or grandfather. <laughs> and, but, so we, we kind of do a tag team that way. Uh, Josephine Farah. Why don't I just pass them to you? Okay. Just leave them. Oh, wait, wait. That's right. Uh, Give me, give me somewhat of a roll. <laughs> Dr. Fred Marchant. <laughs> James Moore. model of efficiency since we've done it yes. once. You, <laughs> you were already moving. You yeah. Know, yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Meredith Nussbaum. <laughs> Ms. N. Yes. Deirdre Smith. And lastly, Mark Walsh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you very much for the privilege of being here. Being here, uh, God bless you all, and keep up that poetry. Keep up the poetry. Thank you. I just realized I am out of order. I missed our lovely library director, Paul Engel. Um, so I will welcome him to the mic to have us <laughs> to do the official welcome that I skipped over. Please, apologies. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> not, not, no, no worries at all. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Paul, and I'm the director of the Brockton Public Library. And, you know, I was talking to Councillor Farwell and, and Councillor Lolly earlier about the tribulations and trials of, of leadership and management. And... Uh, that's all well and true, but you also get the awesome, the awesome opportunity to, to stand up in front of people like you and to just welcome you to this fabulous library. And that's what I'm here to do. Welcome to the Brockton Public Library. Let's get rolling. <laughs> I hope I'm not fired after that. <laughs> um, next, I don't see him, but I could be overlooking. We have Superintendent Mike Thomas. No. Oh, okay. Well, we send our, our love to him uh, in his absence. So without further ado, let's get started. To, uh, this is my favorite part. I love, I'm probably going to be so in awe of all of this. So without further ado, I will introduce our first um, poet and educator, and they are representing Bridgewater State University, James G.H. Moore. And I will read his bio first, and then I will have him grace the mic. James. I will make, <laughs> I will make sure to include that. <laughs> James G. H. Moore earned a BA in English from BSU in 1969, a Master's of Arts in English from BSU in 1980, and attended two MFA poetry program residencies at Goddard College in 1978. He is a poet, novelist, screenwriter, and playwright. After graduating from college in 1969, he wrote a copy for radio, print, and television. He worked for an agency, for a radio station, and as a freelancer in television broadcast. He managed a regional cable news program. He was a co coordinator for the cable access facility in Easton and the coordinator, then station manager for the Bridgewater Cable Access Television Station. He studied radio engineering and production and television engineering and production throughout his broadcast and cable television career. 
He has taught at a number of colleges since 1980 and at BSU since 1994. He enjoys his work, his classrooms and labs, his colleagues and his students. He has been married for 47 years and has two daughters and two granddaughters. <laughs> Welcome. That's what happens when you, uh, you have an introduction, a bio that you're going to hand out, and it's three years in the interim. <laughs> My second granddaughter is two and a half. <laughs> so, I have done in the past from the, this podium, I have written verbally poems and let them just go. Not record, not do anything, just do something extemporaneous from a suggestion from the audience. I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> However, that's a way of explaining that I wrote this today. Um, I started with a few notes in emails with Philip, and then today it finally sort of came together. Luckily, I'm going first, so you're not likely to remember me <laughs> after you're all done. I do not teach. I've, this is not the poem. I do not teach. <laughs> I do not teach. I frame learning. That's what I do. I frame learning. I look at, um, I look, look at my students. I listen to my students. And I refer to some of that in here. <sighs> learning is an opportunity to give people permission to grow. You know, that, that's what the whole process is about and finding the truth of individuals and listening to them and understanding them and growing myself. I'm 74 and I'm still growing. You know, I'm still learning. I will do so until I go, oh. Now the poem. Celebrate poesy and learning. A young poet speaking from cross-hatched pages I promised myself I'd do this too. Of legal pads filled with the desire to make identity, I was once called much too solipsistic, that my words on the page called out too much inner landscape and adolescent, adolescent sturm and drum. It hurt so truly accurate in the playground of public reading, revealed to me like a popped balloon. The way in an, it, it was the way an adolescent poet had framed my rage and anger and my, my blindness to them. Pop. I hated both observations. For the truths of the moment, they were. I never saw until the light was reflected for me by acquaintances I now know to be friends. Choke cherry blossoms in my backyard, aside the purple linden branches, but I'm not sure of the name. Yet they are purple. Flowers stretching all along thin limbs of the ornamental tree, top to bottom against a pale gray and brown. Purple, I am sure of saying. Are the trees so different? Are they friends? They are my teachers now. About the rings of life, leaf, blossom, bark, root. And my 74-year-old sigh about these trees erupts like a sudden atmospheric change. The forms of Psy having ghosted my repertoire of speaking tools only for a short time, almost not really ghosting, more like a long pause between baiting the live mouse trap with peanut butter and laying it out. There are the desperate Psy, 
the pain sigh, the burden sigh, the surprise sigh, and all the other exaltations of need as I frame learning. So I try to breathe and center sight and stumble to teach around corners and high blood pressure, lungs congested with since infancy with asthma and populated by freaked out alveoli. And I think I know where it all goes in the classroom of living, no matter how I medicate or meditate. But I see you seeing me. Your face is looking and not looking. Listening at 450 words a minute to my 150 words a minute palaver. Sometimes a stream of consciousness or a burbling brook of conscience, hopefully wet, moist, sustainable languaging, a neat curve or turn of thought, a physical talking out, a long tap, 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 tap. tap. And your leftover 300 words per minute of cognitive language navigates the flowing rapids and eddying currents of several main streams of your mind, of valuation and opinion and feeling. As I speak and you speak, we journey around bends and flows, only sometimes getting to the same safe landing with all our authentic identities and voices. Classrooms are like this maneuver, a paddling of canoes, splashing and turning over and learning how to row again and again against the streams and with them. Unique minds and tongues and fingers of thought, spectrums of pigment on feet, all talk and face and eye contact, and not. You listen in some manner for the soft touch of truth. Silence listens more than syllables do to many currents and falls the grief over relief, as well as the relief of grief. Your inclined heads, laced fingers, tense faces show your memories play across your cheeks. Outdistancing this narrative thread, completing a circuit of reliving and dipping back into this stream now and then. Classrooms are like this dream. What hands hold to connect out while taking in. Learning to hold more thought currents at one time and find pleasure in the thinking, the framing of learning. It is a poesy and the truths of the moment, no matter how hard, are always true. Thank you. Another round of applause for James. <laughs> when I was working with uh, Philip and coming up with the logistics of this, we, we kind of thought it would be a great idea to put little quotes from each uh, different poets in between this. So the first one, I, I love this one. I turned silence and nights into words. What was unutterable, I wrote down. I made the whirling world stand still. Arthur Rimbrod. Next, we have uh, Deidre Smith from Brockton High School. <laughs> Born, 
Born and raised in Bloomfield, Connecticut, Deidre Smith moved to Massachusetts in the late 1990s, eventually receiving her bachelor's degree in English literature and master's degree in teaching English from Bridgewater State University. Upon graduation in 2001, she began her career as an educator at Brockton High School teaching sophomore and senior English. Since then, she has explored all literary genres with freshmen, sophomore, and senior students at all levels. Mrs. Smith continues to share her love of literature with her students and helps them appreciate the power of the written and spoken word. As much as she loves a great novel, poetry, she holds a place, um, a special place in her heart for those things. Although Ms. Smith is, Mrs. Smith is not one to write her own original poetry often, <laughs> she enjoys works from Maya Angelou, Nikki, G Nikki Giovanni, and Alice Walker, all three of my favorites too. Welcome, Deidre Smith. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, the poem I'm gonna read today uh, was written the year that I met Philip for the first time. Uh, he, he and I got together and we talked about him coming into my classroom a freshman and sharing poetry through art. And so Philip brought in works of art, different sculptures, the students sat around in a circle, we passed the artwork around the room, they touched it, they, they picked it up. Uh, and then we segued into, um, you know, poetry and art are just ways to express yourself. And the students were given an assignment to write an original poem. And I challenged them to try to memorize it and perform it. And, uh, you know, it went over kind of interestingly. Uh, and we worked on it a couple of weeks and Philip came in and one day a student said, well, Mrs. Smith, if, if you're making us do it, you have to do it as well. And I went, oh, great, okay. I, I'm with you kids, I got it, I'll do it. And, and this poem uh, is a result of, of that experience. Uh, it's called The Intruder. <clears throat> the intruder has broken in. He has forced his way into my mother's brain and destroyed our relationship. Stolen the parts of my mother that made her who she was. Because of this intruder, she now looks at me differently. She looks but doesn't see. I am a stranger. I scare her. I make her uncomfortable. I am the bully who tells her what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. The intruder has hijacked her freedom and independence. She is bitter like the yellow citrus lemon peel. She is angry like the raised red welt of the rubber band popped on your wrist. Resentful. But sometimes the intruder is hiding. Mom looks at me and smiles. Not exactly full recognition, but she knows me. I am a relative. Her sister, perhaps? A distant cousin, maybe? Not her daughter, Deidre, though. While the intruder hides, she trusts me and smiles. She knows this stranger, and we share a laugh. The intruder may be hiding, but he isn't leaving. The intruder has broken in. And now, mom and I approach each day and attempt some reconnection. The intruder is always there, lurking and stalking, altering our relationship, silent and sneaky. Thank you. My writing, it's my way of making sense of everything, my way to feel whole. May I never be complete and may I never feel content, please. Let me always have the need, always have the urge to write. Charlotte Erickson. Thank you, Deidre. Next, we have, uh, also from Brockton High School, Meredith Nussbaum. Meredith Nussbaum is a poet from Long Island, New York, that moved to Massachusetts for love and stayed to serve as a biology teacher at Brockton High School. Meredith's poetry explores the ideas of love, loss, and longing, and draws inspiration from the natural world and mythology. She is fascinated by how poetry can capture the essence of a thing using nothing but sound and open air. 
Meredith has not shared her poetry out loud in several years and is humbled at the opportunity to add her voice to the group of talented educators. We welcome to the mic, Meredith. Hope is not a buoy, it is an anchor, and this is not a love story. I was born on an island in a harbor town, swaddled in kindness and grace. The first daughter, the third of what would be six beautiful children. And we ran through the woods, laughed on the swings, screamed fighting dragons, playing pretend. We spent summers by the ocean, the rush, the smell, the sound, of water and waves still lingers in my dreams. We sang so loud. But this is not a love story. Hope. Hope is not a blooming flower. It is the rocky soil and the shadow of the Appalachian Mountains. I spent four years learning how to swallow disappointment, growing accustomed to the taste of regret, regret and drinks you ordered by color. I learned that sometimes your everything just isn't enough. I learned that mending broken hearts is best done in the company of good friends and chocolate pudding. Mm -hmm. Outside of empty rooms, I learned how to write poetry out loud. But this is not a love story. Hope is not an empty canvas. It is the easel. Paint will stick to basically anything. <laughs> and I did not make capital A art. I made a mess, and since you can't truly separate the art from the artist, I was the mess. And I didn't have anything to say until I learned how to say no, and this is not a love story. Hope is not a singing bird. It is a clawed foot delicately curled in death, a string wound around an ankle, a yellow tag with neat jet black handwriting, a label a specimen kept in a drawer, climate controlled and expertly stored, the plumage, her plumage, drab compared to her colorful male counterparts, they will never fly again. They will lay together for eternity. It is sad and sweet, but this is not a love story. Hope is not a full tank of gas. It is the road that led me to here. I still have the receipt for every single toll I paid, still tucked under the visor of my black Toyota Corolla. I still remember the light in the tunnel, how tired and giddy I was at the thought of you. But this is not a love story. Hope is not the sunrise, it is the darkness of the night when you held my face in your hands and kissed me so softly. This is not a love story. You said my name, my name to the stars and they heard you silent in the sky, your unabashed adoration stretching to the edge of the known universe. This is not a love story. You wipe the tears from my cheeks, tease me gently for my smudged eyeliner. You didn't have to say anything. I knew this is more than just a love story. Hope, hope is a word we don't say. It is our breath. Thank you. So much talent coming out of Brockton High School. Um, I also want to take the moment, because it's only fitting to, to make this announcement, is that we have one of our Young Poet Laureates uh, finalists here today, Ayana Blake, who is also representing Brockton High School. Um, just want to thank Awesome. Um, and our next poet and educator actually is coming out of Cardinal Spellman, and we also have another uh, finalist here with us today, and that's Hannah Baptiste. I just want to acknowledge her as well. Thank you. Our next poet and educator is Melissa Renee Brown, uh, representing Cardinal Spellman. Melissa Brown is an educator representing Spelman, Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Spelman High School in Brockton, Massachusetts. She graduated from Stonehill College with a degree in English and secondary education. 
She has always had a deep love for poetry that led her to write from an early age. While in college, she wrote for the Kern, Stonehill's literary journal. She shares her love of poetry every day in her English classroom and is thrilled to be able to participate in this program. Let's give a warm welcome to Melissa Renee Brown. Untitled, or Ars Poetica. <laughs> Writing is like getting punched in the face by the imaginary friend you abandoned in grade school. Blood wells in your mouth until you stop holding it in when you start to taste it, and it spills out onto the paper into Rorschach splatters, unhelpful as I lack introspection. Okay. This is a different poem. Okay. Evergreen. I wish I was evergreen. The sun parts with me yearly, sometimes sweetly, soft kisses glowing on my cheek and at her touch. Sometimes we just grow apart. And sometimes I wake in the morning aching and find her side of the bed empty. I try to fit my body into her impression Strands of warmth still burning in me pull away, spinning like thread into shining silk to clothe her in the winter months, leaving me dizzy and wanting. I wish I was evergreen. I wish I could shake these petals and crush them like they weren't my life's work. I wish I was evergreen. Give me roots. Give me spines as weapons, plates of bark as armor. I would survive through blankets of frost and, sn and snow and starvation and pain. I would grow strong and slow. And when she finally returns, arms wide longing for my company, I would sit. But I'm not evergreen. When she peeks out from below the horizon, reve reveals herself to the earth after months of absence again, before she even calls, I will run and weep in her arms, and she will speak tenderly into my ear how beautiful I am, how I will grow and burst into flowers and live. And I believe her, God, every time. You don't write to say something, you write because you have something to say. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Next, we have Kate DeMarca from Massasoit Community College. Kate DeMarca is an associate professor of English at Massasoit Community College, an advisor to the Student Performing Arts Club, and a faculty member of the Global Learning at Mass Massasoit team. Professor DeMarca organizes and facilitates Mic Drop Massasoit, a spoken word open mic series at the college. She was instrumental in the planning of World Poetry Day events at Massasoit in 2019 and 2020. She enjoys writing poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, and plays. A lifelong Massachusetts resident, Professor DeMarca is thrilled to see the poetry community here in Brockton grow and thrive. Please welcome Kate DeMarca. everyone. Um, so I'll start with a poem I wrote two years ago. Picture this. It's late March 2020. <laughs> Everything is shut down. Schools, offices, a lot of stores. I take a walk. There isn't much else to do. Exit pandemic. Yesterday, I walked out of the present and into the past. I spent a quiet hour in a lost century. I slipped in and breathed in damp earth and cool air and walked upon the grounds of a country estate. All around, signs of early spring, an open rolling lawn meets the stream. Robins peck at stubs of grass and compete with long-necked geese back from winter travel. 
A white magnolia tree beckons with delicate blossoms still sparsely in bloom. A sudden burst of light brightens the overcast sky. I step in sneakers along the dirt path to the manor, standing apart, serene. I gape in my sweatshirt and jeans. But no one is here demanding my departure. It's just me, the 21st century interloper, escaping infinite unease, wondering how this magic found me, wondering how long this magic lasts. And next I have um, a poem that was untitled until yesterday. I like to tell my students, you can continue working on a poem for months, years even. Sometimes it takes that long to get an idea when you're stuck, but it does come eventually if you don't give up on it. On that note, this poem is about the creative process and taking those first steps toward creating something. And it's called Sleeping Underground. Sometimes, it's dormant like a volcano, hibernating like a bear, hiding like a rabbit, sleeping underground. It waits for spring? No, for you. Let hot words climb high and burst into air. Let them flow over hard rocks and burn as truth. Watch them yawn and wake Lumber, then walk, feel the morning sun and roar. See them sniff, twitch their long ears, and hop tentatively toward hope. <laughs> One more. Um, this is olive oil, and the name of the poem is Olive Oil. And it's the story of my Sicilian grandmother who came to America when my dad was a child. I'd like to dedicate this poem today to my dad's brother, my uncle Carmen, who passed away suddenly in Sicily this year. He was an incredible musician, and like my nana, he loved to cook. And you'll hear about him in this poem as well. Olive oil. She lets it flow liberally out of the bottle, and slowly one bubble and then another expands and bursts near the top of the, of the tall gray stove pot on low simmer, where fresh, ripe, crushed tomatoes thicken. Garlic coats the air in her cramped kitchen. She pours salt into her palm before she lets it go, too, into the old pot on the stove. Her English is rough, but her food is heaven. She wears variations of blue. In 1956, a sturdy black trunk was fastened shut with shirts and pants for her three small boys, cloth diapers for the baby, table coverings and bedspreads handmade by relatives as parting gifts, all folded and packed with precision and care. Not to be opened until the ship docked in New York. Prayers to the saints for a safe passage. Then the journey by car to Massachusetts where her sister's family all waited for their arrival from Martha, Martha Sant Anastasia, Sicily. How did it feel to leave the only life she knew to come here, to this land? Did the prickly pears taste sweeter? The blood red oranges seem redder. Did La Montagna loom larger as the date of departure crept close? The winter sky sang shuri shuri and the rich soil cried Sicilia beda, Sicilia mia. From each misshapen tree branch, the olives watched the family as they drove away from town on roads through rugged hills. The olives watched and the olives waited. In 8th century BC, the Greeks left their homeland and landed in what is now Sicily bringing their knowledge of trees, olive trees. Watching fireworks one night, my father fell asleep in an olive tree and all of Motha looked for him. In the time of Roman rule, olive trees were planted all around the Mediterranean, encircling the sea and reaping liquid gold. Try this, you'll go out of your mind, my CEO common raves about his chicken piccata, luxuriously sauteed. 
crumbling stones with only mere memories, echoes of what was whispered in the infrequent wind. I stand next to my grandmother in her crowded kitchen, and I write down everything. For 67 minutes, she washes, peels, cuts, stirs, slices, boils, simmers, and finally tastes. She can't explain her recipes to me, and so I write them down in detailed steps. The English words she needs may as well still be somewhere beyond the sea, but all my life I have known her and she knows me. She knows what she sees and what she is told in her Sicilian native tongue. She turns the stovetop knob to the left and the gas flame disappears. She sings as she always sings, Pasta ready. <laughs> Poetry is not only dreams and visions, it is the skeleton architecture of our lives. It lays the foundations for a future of change, a bridge across our fears of what has never been before. Audre Lorde. Next we have Mark Walsh, also from Massasoit. Mark Walsh is a professor of English at Massasoit Community College in Brockton, Massachusetts, where he teaches introduction to philosophy, freshman English, and British literature. He has organized poetry events and readings in Plymouth, Quincy, and Brockton. Through Massasoit Television, he created and hosted Writers at Work and is currently developing a new show, Out of the Marvelous, which will focus on poets and poetry in southeastern Massachusetts. In addition to teaching, Mark is also a writer, having stories, articles, and poems published in various newspapers and literary magazines. Please help me welcome Mark Walsh. Hello, thank you all for coming. It's such an honor to be here among all these talented poets. I have a couple of poems I'd like to read today, and in a few of these poems, um, the teacher comes out, the concern for the student, and so this first one uh, is, is about just that, and this is uh, called Stacking Wood. The easy part was over. The dull chainsaw reduced the quarter ton bow to liftable logs for the fire pit. Packed with geometry in the wheelbarrow, hauled to the far corner of the yard, chunked together to form an ordered pile of three up and two back, portions of oak clack into place like drumsticks dropped in a sack. The honesty of this work is a relief. The aches, the lumbered breathing from stacking wood is an afternoon's clean meditation. Mulling over the duration for proper seasoning before the burn offers measured freedom from the blank quandary of a student with no money for his store of textbooks. Um, my dad was a terrific guy, and I owe my love of poetry to him. Um, not that I had any choice in the matter, because oftentimes when we were driving somewhere and stuck in traffic, he would take the opportunity to recite his favorite lines from Alexander Pope, or the full rendition of the creation of the cremation of Sam McGee by Robert Service. So he gave me that. And he also, he also uh, uh, created an enthusiasm in me for bird watching, which, uh, which I, st I still do to this day. So um, this, is, this really is a, a poem about bird watching uh, that just happened uh, out of my back deck, and it's called Worry Hour. The back deck was hers for a moment's patrol as she landed light, feet splayed across the rail. She was proud and sharp forceful enough to disturb peripheral vision. Plump, round breast of blurred brown, beige and peach, soothing tones beneath supernova eyes and deathlock beak. All violence without being violent. Head rotating round and again round, noticing everything we do not. Feathers hid secret sense, tuning to what we cannot hear homing in towards the heartbeat vibrations of her noon meal? Or was it the skittish throb of her watchers? Flitting where she did not look, scrub jays alight on top branches of tall sumac, jabbing beaks as if peeking at, pecking at stray bugs, 
alert with worry as Huntress heaves herself from fence to tall chair back sitting near the tree line, the pivoting head narrowing its rotation like a well-tuned radar. Jay's followed, settling on branches directly above, open surveillance a grim safeguard for the hidden home that brought them into the defensive frenzy. Time tightened, hawk wings flared and flapped, raising her to the spiked top of a snapped pine, then folded calmly, blending her like a clump of dead leaves that refused to fall. Natural tension of a natural course. Now, at some undiscovered signal, jays take to air, swooping and swirling, chasing each other like bored squirrels. They dive and lift rapidly, agitating the mid-level canopy just enough to shake the air and disrupt listening. The fury of false play continues until out of dappled wood, she came flying low like some ancient reptile of air, banked left and strafed the grass, accelerating as she crossed the street and vanished. The space where scrub jays swarmed held only thin pines, leafy ash, overgrown vines. A mother's tragedy is another's victory. What's left is a bearable harshness revealing more of an absent God than empty stomachs. Now this next poem is, is about students proper. Um, in the first year of the pandemic, um, we couldn't hold our commencement at Massasoit so uh, we were all encouraged to make videos of congratulations for our students. And um, I had an idea that I was going to write this poem. And of course, me being who I am, I didn't finish it by the time the deadline came. I, I literally finished it the day after the deadline. And then, you know. But Ed, where's Ed? I, I know my buddy Ed Krasno here. He knows all about me and deadlines. So, so I'd like to read this now. And this is, this is to all graduating students. And uh, this is a guide to happiness from a deeply unqualified poet. Okay. <laughs> to be happy in this life, don't look too deeply into the darkness. The nothing that you will find there will cause you to fill it with your own dark thoughts. Take comfort in the fact that while life's tragedies are vast, life's comedies outnumber them 50 to 1, but can be tiny and sometimes slip past the noticing. To be happy in this life, you need tasty things to eat, you need beautiful things to look at, you need interesting things to read, and you need sensational things to listen to. But above all, you have to have something to look forward to, even if it's getting an ice cream with a friend. Speaking of friends, make them. <laughs> Find the people who share your interests and spend as much time with them as time allows. Find the people who don't share your interests and enjoy the arguing because the arguments can show you wisdom. Find the people with empathy and let that be a bond between you. Hold no one as an enemy. If you find someone you cannot in all good faith tolerate, simply wish them well and go back to tending your garden. Never hesitate to tell someone what you believe. Most will appreciate your clarity. And if they dislike it or reject you, that's on them. If you provide an unpleasant someone room in your head, be sure to charge them rent. <laughs> to be happy in life, you need time to be alone, to look at the world around you, look deeply in for a good long time, and then ask, I wonder what comes next? And then this last poem here, um, I'd like to read. This is the first time I've ever read this poem in public, but this is not the first time this poem has been read in public. I was very honored last year when uh, Philip was, was helping me sort this poem out. And then in one email, he said, you know, I'm doing a reading, and I would really like to read this poem at that. Would that be OK? And I said, sure. <laughs> Who am I to deny Philip anything? So, <laughs> But this is, this is kind of related to the last stanza of, of the preceding poem. And this is called Getting Outside. It's impossible to look at a field of trees and find stillness. Air rustles dry leaves or thrusts a bough along a length of trunk. Holding the forest canopy in view, movement finds its way to you in the distant sway of limbs separating to veil glimpses of bright, cloudy sky. It's easier to watch than it is to forget. When the blues hit, 
Open all doors and windows in your house. Listen for the breeze and let it invite you where a garden needs weeding or birds need counting. Name the birds you count. Learn a sparrow from a chickadee from a woodpecker. Relax the eye along the landscape until they show themselves in quick hops and darting pecks. Take in what is in front of you, careful not to miss what needs to be seen. Accomplish small tasks that provide weird worth. The least amount of action can flatten the greatest heap of anxiety. Where the world is broken is where the sparrow endures. Thank you. Poetry has never been the language of barriers. It's always been the language of bridges. Amanda Gorman. Next, we have Josephine Farah. Josephine Farah is a Lebanese-American, first-generation, first-year teacher, and graduate of BSU in 2021. Farah double majored in English education and minored in Middle East studies and has a certific uh, certificate in TESOL. She is a longtime quiet poet and first-time presenter of her poems. Please help me welcome Josephine Farah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I've never written a bio about myself, so that's why that's what it sounded like. Um, so I wrote two poems for today. Um, I'm really excited to be able to present this first poem. I was writing during some of my like quiet times in class during lunch. Uh, made me think a lot about my kids. I'm an eighth grade teacher. Uh, this is my first year teaching, so it's really exciting. Um, so this one's called First Generation Educator. <sighs> I stand at the front of the room. Watchful eyes gaze back at me. While we are not the same for a variety of reasons, on a variety of levels, we share too many similarities. <laughs> Bless you. Eighth grade ELA. The kids make jokes, we laugh, we have discussions, we have serious discussions, we share similar interests. It's wild how I turned up here. This is my daily reminder of how lucky I am. You can be anything you wanna be, they tell you from grade eight to grade 12. If you wanna be this, you need these grades. If you want to be this, this is how long you need to be in school. All of this kind of gets told to us at the end of our high school career. I strolled through high school barely absorbing anything. I decided the future is in my hands and these hands did not care. Fighting teenage angst, mental illness, undiagnosed learning disorders, all while being told what I'm producing isn't the expectation. Well, girls like her, they sometimes need a special school. The words fell off the lips of my counselors like daggers to the hearts of my parents. Joey, what does that mean? Graduate high school, but barely. In the sea of Harvard, Yale, BC, BU, Yukon. My name is announced over the PA. Josephine Farah, Bunker Hill Community College. Yes. Was it the only school I applied to? No. What is it the only school I got into? Yes. Nothing wrong with it but the expectation for me was higher. I stare out now in a sea of faces who rely on me to educate them. My goal in life is to change the world, and it still is. But what I'm doing now versus what I would have done is completely different in all the right ways. I'm a first generation educator, and I'm proud to say it. Uh, I have one more poem. It's 
not as long, I hope, um, but I am dedicating this to the kids that are in my homeroom. Um, I have eight tattoos, and I've gotten about four of them while I've been teaching. And every time I walk in with a different tattoo, the kids have a variety of questions. Uh, so this is to my kids in my homeroom. It's called Your Kid's Favorite Role Model. I am your kid's favorite role model. I've got tattoos and piercings. <laughs> what they don't know is how much I swear outside the four words of these well-decorated classroom walls. The creations that are added to my body that get me second looks walking down the street. The creations added to show art that goes beyond the four walls of our minds. Miss Farah, which one hurt the most? Miss Farah, where did you get the idea? Miss Farah, will you get one dedicated to us? <laughs> did this get them learning about Demetrius and Lysander? Did it spark the idea of Helena and Hermia's lives? No, probably not. Possibly? Depends on what they saw at Demetrius and Lysander, Helena and Hermia looking like, and how many tattoos they might have had. This was the reason I'm here. Extend their thinking and force them to go beyond the four walls of their own minds. How do we connect the dots of their interests and our educating them? Monkey's paw and adding horror. Shakespeare and movies that are beyond their time but closer to mine. The gaps that can be filled with simple conversations. Space that can be filled with creativity and imagination. I am your kid's favorite role model, tattoos and all. I loved A Midsummer's Night's Dream. That was one of my favorite plays by Shakespeare. Actually, what we covered this year. <laughs> I wish I was still in school to, learn, to read that. We are all poets in heart. Each beat is a word, every breath an experience. Philip Hosaurus, and I would like to introduce him to the to mic right before we introduce our guest speaker here. So next week, next uh, Saturday, up in the Driscoll Art Gallery, we, Brockton, will be selecting our first Youth Poet Laureate. I hope everybody can come. <clears throat> Part of the criteria for becoming Youth Poet Laureate is to write a poem about Brockton. Um, it was the same with me when I um, um, applied to be a Brockton Poet Laureate. So this is my Brockton poem. Brockton Boy. I am a Brockton boy, proud of my city streets, born to parents from a foreign land, drawn here to find prosperity, and finding, finding so much more. I am a Brockton boy raised in the bosom of the city, Walnut Street, Ash Street, Kensington Place, Park Road, infant, child, youth, teen, young man, now adult. I am a Brockton boy educated by the streets, playgrounds, schools aware my city took in all ethnicities, nations uniting, sharing customs, the dignity of heritage. I can swear in 10 languages. <laughs> I know the taste of diverse cuisines. I've had my heart and spirit crushed, then raised up to feel the blessing of forgiveness. I felt the city experience adversity and with a one-two punch and uppercut, come off the ropes and beat back misfortune, champion, rising time and time, again and again. This city will not be counted out. I am a Brockton boy, married, uniting two cultures, raising two daughters, fulfilling a promise to our ancestors to pass along the respect 
for a city that shaped my values, how to be human, how to feel, how to pay it forward. My daughters now are teachers, caring and sculpting our children's future. I am a Brockton boy, raised in a city built on hard work, a city of honor, a city like no other, welcoming open hearts with firm hands. The brick and mortar of this city, lined along the streets by calloused hands that laid a foundation of stories passed down from generation to generation. A city tough as leather reshaped with the toil and sweat of tears and determination, the soul of a people uncompromised. A city that puts one foot in front of the other. This city, resilient, has given me the life experience to shout out loud, I am a proud man. Brockton, your boy has grown up. Thank you, Brockton Poet Laureate. It is with great pleasure that I introduce this next educator and poet, Fred Marchant from Suffolk University. Fred Marchant is a longtime teaching affiliate of the William Joyner Center for the Study of War and Social Consequences at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. For 30 years, he was a professor of English and the director of the Creative Writing Program and the Poetry Center at Suffolk University. He has also taught workshops at various sites across the country, including the Robert Frost Place, the Fine Arts Work Center, and the Veterans Writing Group. In 2009, Marchant was a co-winner of the May Sarton Award from the New England Poetry Club, given to poets whose work is an inspiration to other poets. Marchant's poetry collections include Said Not Said, The Looking House, Tipping Point, and Full Moon Boat. It is my pleasure to introduce Fred Marchant. There are so many pleasures here today. I don't know how to say it's my pleasure to be here. Because I want to say this is a beautiful assembly of poets and teachers and the sense of community that that, that, that implies. And so, um, so thank you, well, thank you everyone. We'll start, at, we'll start with Philip. Let me tell you a story. I've been sitting here thinking about what story do I want to tell about this man. Um, but this will give you a good example of the depth of his heart and his commitment. For many years, he um, organized in this library a reading series based on the Brain Injury Association. I think that's the right name of the organization, the Massachusetts chapter of it. And they, the Brain Injury Association had um, visual art courses and there would be an exhibition. And Philip would then ask poets in the area to write poems in response to those, those artworks. The internet helped. Eventually, there were photographs put up uh, so you could consult those if you wanted. But if you wanted to see the thing itself, you, know, you had to ask. And Philip never refused. Many times, no, well, at least twice in the cold, a cold February day, he came up to Arlington with his I think it was a forester, packed the whole thing, packed with artwork, and let me take a look at the pieces that I, you know, I might consider wanting to write and respond. And, I, and every once in a while, I, and I think I told him once, I said, reminded me of when I was a boy, and I grew up in Providence, and fireworks were illegal. But somebody would go to New Hampshire <laughs> and come down and throw open the trunk and, and sell fireworks out of the back of the. And I thought Philip was, sell, was he was sell, giving away poetry fireworks out of the back. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for this honor. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you many times over for inviting me to read in this series. Thank you, my other readers. Thank you, the mayor's office. Thank you, the city councilors. And I want to say a word about everyone who doesn't fall into one of those categories. Um, the great Mexican poet Octavio Paz once said, I paraphrase, uh, I try to make a point. He said, you know, the real poem is a circle, one half of which 
a reader creates. Well, in this case, a listener, too. That we are all sort of part of that circle. So reading this poem, these poems, you know, is not a solitary enterprise. In fact, it is a communal enterprise. I'm going to do a little bit of hamming it up to just, you know, it's a long day at all. But I'm going to step away from the microphone to show you what I mean. <clears throat> the word listen has in its deep root list. You know, when something lists, you know? And I always think that that listening, that kind of listening is what poetry asks. It asks you to lean forward. And in a sense, that spatial fact is a way of sort of acknowledging this is a larger circle that we create. We're scheduled to go to five o'clock, so I'll take an hour and 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> no, I'm gonna read for about 20 minutes at the max, but I'm gonna do a, a sampler of poems that have some connection to our theme. A Place at the Table. It means there is no place to hide. It means you will not drift off to sleep or carve your name on your arm or give anyone here the finger. It means you do not have to wave your hand as if you were drowning. It means there is nothing here that will drown you. It means you really do not have to have the answer. Since there are only a few of you left, sitting across from you, it means you can study their faces as you would the clouds outside. You will not totally forget them. It means you are now roughly, for a while, just about equal. In the center, there is nothing unless someone gives it. It means when you are gone, everyone feels it. It means that when you leave, you feel as if you haven't, that you still have a place at the table. Later in your life, this moment will return to you as a mote of dust that floats in on the spars of sunlight. It will search every room until it finds you. Now, at the beginning of the poem, that's not easy. <laughs> right? you know, this is a poem that has its origin. Oh, no, please don't. No, <laughs> no the, the, this is a poem that has its, I'm going to tell you its origin, then I'm going to tell you what I thought about its origin, and then tell you how I wrote it. But the origin was, um, I was at a dreadful committee meeting. <laughs> And, you know, as an academic, everyone knows what that's like, right? And it was, it was sitting, there was a square, yeah, a square circle, <laughs> uh, but there was a square set of tables. There was nothing in the middle, and somebody was, maybe it was me, I don't want to be, you know, su superior to my context, but, but um, you know, someone was droning on, right? And I'm saying to myself, you know, I feel right now like a very bored student. You know, and I started to think of my students. I was, God, how many times could that have been in my class, right? And then I started thinking, no, it's, more, it's so much better than that in real teaching, not committee meetings, right? That what happens in, in real teaching is someone, so, someone, is something so much more than just, what, the, the passing on of knowledge or information. There is something really extraordinary about real learning and real teaching. It's like that listening in poetry, that somehow one leans together, one leans toward each other. And then I started to think, you know, there's something extraordinary about um, the long-term effect of, say, reading a poem together and thinking over and over about two words, three words, wondering what they mean and do. And all of a sudden, I realized my whole life, I mean, I don't remember poems well, but, I, but what happens to me is that words come sneaking in every once in a while, or a moment of a poem, 
will come back to mind. And I said, oh God, it's sort of like they're looking for you still. The poems that you love are still with you and they're poking you around in your house saying, where is he, where is he? And, and so I started to think, yeah, that's what it means to be at this table. You know, this table of, of, of art, of, of commitment to art, to language. You know, when I think of everyone listening to me read poems for 15 or 20 minutes, that's a hard chore, you know? I get tired of myself sometimes. Well, not often, but, you know, uh, <laughs> the truth is that, that you know, listening is hard work. Absorbing and, and taking it in is hard work. However, I, I propose it's really worth it. This is not another, another not so easy poem, but it's another, it's another poem that's out of that same sort of imaginative um, context. <clears throat> Many of you have read the Odyssey. Even if you haven't, you may know the story of, of Odysseus returning, taking 10 years to return from the Trojan War. Um, <clears throat> Lots of detours and delays, but he gets some advice about how to, he, he's told by, um, he's told that if he stops off at one island and, and, and does the appropriate ritual, um, he will have open up a door to the underworld and they'll give him a direction, set of directions home. That's in book 11. So I taught book 11 many times. And this is about that, but it's, you don't need to know Book 11. It's about that feeling of being, um, yeah, I can tell you that, I can tell how this poem began. I remember thinking, you know, sometimes when you have seats like this, you have to say to folks, okay, let's make a circle, all right? And I, I remember teaching Book 11 one time, and I had people in a circle, and I looked, and I said, hmm. And I started to say, you know, right in the middle of this room is what we're talking about. I mean, that's what Odysseus was doing. He was digging a hole in the beach, on the beach, in the sand, pouring in some blood, some wine, some honey, I think, and, and ritually conjuring an opening into the afterlife. And I thought, that's what we're doing, actually, in this room, in this strange way of listening to poetry, thinking about it. A class on Book 11. When we spoke about the return from the war, how he probed the beach with his sword pouring into the hole, a mix of blood, honey, and wine, we felt a small aperture opening within the words. Shades rose to the threshold, some eager as children let out from school. Others lingered in the grayness, their lives burdened with more than was deserved. We saw some worth fearing, thick, brutal men who clutched at what they thought they would do. Others with furtive glances wanted to name who was at fault, who had made amends. We heard, as if in a room nearby, a song as gentle to the ear as pages returned together. A light wind carried the notes, but not the words. And when the song ended, a nylon jacket sifted from a chair to the floor, billowing like a sail. It landed softly, like a friend's touch on the forearm, turning you in the direction of your home. You should have brought a jacket and dropped it at that moment. <laughs> yeah, that's too late. The moment's passed. Um, <laughs> What I, what, what I wanted to say in, in, in this side of the poem is that, is that, that, that book 11 has the most heartbreaking moment when in that set of that aperture into the underworld, Odysseus has been away 10 years and doesn't know his mother has died. Um, he sees her. And of course, he's so happy to see her. And, and he tries to put his arms around her and they pass right through the, the shade. And that's how he learns of his mother's death. I grew up in Providence, as I said. Um, this will be a little shift in gears here. This is called Camp and Locust. House on the corner where I grew up. Second floor flat that I still find in dreams. Window from which I see Candy squirm out of his collar again. 
It is always a lurid purple night, the middle of summer. He is taking off, having figured it out, and is headed toward all that existence promises, even to dogs. Now, I'm very fond of this poem, and I shouldn't say that. Right? But, but for one thing, um, when my sister and mother bought the puppy home, the Beagle puppy home, I said, they said, you got to name it. I said, how do I name it? They said, well, something you like. So it, suddenly Candy became kind of gender fluid in the name, you know, because <laughs> he was a boy <laughs> named Candy. And, uh, <laughs> and he, he always took off. He took off regularly. And, um, and I never quite knew why he loved taking off. It was maybe that, that we tracked him down every time and brought him back, um, scolded but celebrating. Um, but in this poem, there was something that I wanted to convey that was, oh, you know, about us rather than candy. And it's not said. It's, it's implied. It's, it, you can hear it in the tone, the even to dogs tone. You know, it's as if someone is saying, yeah, you know, there is, life should promise more to us. Kind of it makes me think that that is one of the pieces of work to do with poetry and teaching and learning and the listening part of it to to hear a tone of voice is to hear more than the, the you know the dictionary content of the of the given set of words it's to it's to hear a human being saying those words and to imagining them and to imagine or to practice imagining the human being who would say those words. I touch Providence and I touch my, excuse me, my childhood in another way. This is called Providence Halfway. I'd like to wake at sea, rise at dawn and paint the disappearing night fog, shades of white for the fog, shades of black for the rest. I would resist thinking these had anything to do with race with a memory of a morning centered on me and Eddie Bolden on different sides of a rusted fence, him black, me white, and neither of us much beyond six. The grasses up to our thighs as we spoke about what I cannot recall. But I'm certain it was not a reason to punch me in the face, which he wound up and did anyway. Was I bragging about my clothes, the yard? Or was it a tone that he alone could hear? One that said, I thought the world was good, or would be, at least to me. Something about my easy smile under fair weather clouds and shade catalpas, where neighborhoods abutted, the corner of camp and locust, halfway up the hill to hope and some other names for irony that have washed ashore here in Providence and its adjacent plantations. Some of you may know that Providence has voted the word plantations out of its name. It no longer is Providence and plant plantations, city of Providence and plantations. Well, tone of voice matters, <laughs> is my point. <laughs> <clears throat> the oldest living thing in, in the biomass of this planet is the bristlecone pine tree. Some are thought to be 10,000 years old. They list, they, they, they list, I just said something, really, you know, how the mind works, all of a sudden you get a poem. They, they, they live on the edge of uh, cliffs and canyons in the dry um, climes of the southwest. Um, in the mountains usually, uh, too. Um, but, but when I said, when I was going to say list, they, they kind of bend over, too. And they're, they look like they're dead. They, there's only a little bit of green at the ends of this and that, and some pine cones. The rest of it is wood, because it's, that protects them from, and probably the result of lightning strikes in those precarious spots. 
bristlecone. Oh, one last thing. I was going to make a transition there, too, in another way. Then, so, so Candy and Eddie Bolden make appearances in my poems. They make appearances in my mind. They visit me, all right? And so, too, trees. Bristlecone. Sometimes a tree will be there when you need it most. When you realize that you've been breathing too long in the high, thinned out air. Maybe you've staggered, tripped on a rock you warned yourself about, but tripped on anyway. Marmots may be signaling your coming, and you could answer with your, your own set of clicks and whistles, but all this would only deepen the dizziness, the spin of nausea, the dread combining with delight and reaching the rim of the canyon. Below, the rock shapes waver, and you are not the first to think they look like the dead. You want to run after them, to tug and plead. The feeling as it rises has its own strong winds. You know that lightning and rain will be coming. You stand in one of the eroded places, seeking out that tree. Josephine, I, want, I was going to say something about Josephine that I, we discovered, remembered that we knew each other, that I visited her class, one of her English classes at Bridgewater State a couple of years ago. Let me just tell you, that was the best class with the best students. You know, it really, I mean, I don't know how much time it was, 75 minutes went by like 10, you know. I'm heading into some, um, well, not totally new poems. I'll, I'll do a couple of new and a couple of rec recent, we'll put it that way, yeah. But I think I'm going to stick with trees for a minute. Um, this is a brand new poem. Lilac. Not the tree per se, not the blossom, the scent already gone, but its bark, the limbs entwined, how they glow in late sunlight, are wholly present to the light they meet. Only now these long, neglected stems of what we like to call wooden. How they bring the light into what they are. They look like an idea of lilac forming, or a desire stirring upward, entwined, but not inseparable. They look like what in this world love is. About 10 years ago, I was on a delegation of folks from an organization called the Interfaith Peace Builders. It was a subdivision of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, one of the long, longest lasting pacifist organizations in the Western world. Um, and. It, it was to Israel and the West Bank, and it was to, specifically to meet with nonviolent activists in both sides of that conflict. And, um, you know, do what? Well, learn, and also, um, you know, recognize. It was, it was in October, and it was at the Olive Harvest time, and the poem is called The Olive Harvest. It's true. The tree has the scent of the sea. But the silver leaves, their slender fingers, the thick, infinitely twined trunk, some riddle in the roots that lets it drink from the stones, even the place where a limb has broken or been lopped off, the shoot that springs back to life, stumps that burn for an hour and then an hour, Upon hour, a scattered, discard twig you press to your lips, and the fruit that hangs from young branches and old, a green reddening to black, this fruit, ripened on enough bloodshed and hardened human behavior to make you think it will turn away in disgust. Year after suffering year comes back, saying here and here, and here. <clears throat> I'm 
going to read two bird poems. They're very, these two birds are really recent. These are pandemic birds. <laughs> First one is for a teacher, dedicated to a teacher of mine, a man named George Morgan. As I said, I went to in Providence and I, and I so, I so love the idea of celebrating Bunker Hill, by the way. Um, and I know very well that feeling. I worked my way up and got transferred to Brown eventually, right, where I met this teacher, George Morgan, who had the habit of bringing in all kinds of things to class. And one day he brought in um, a recording of a Gregorian chant in, from some monks in France and saying this was the most authentic version of Gregorian chant in the modern era. I, you know, that didn't mean much to me at that moment, but a few years later, specifically, um, three years later after I had been in the military, left as a conscientious objector, um, I made a pilgrimage to that place to hear this music. Well, that was a long time ago. However, last spring, I thought of that place again. Its name is Solem. Solem is a, an abbey. It's a, there's an abbey there in Solem, France. It's a small village. It's a Benedictine monastery. Time for a, a cardinal to perch in our locust and sing the evening song. The neighbor's bronze-hued cat peeks around the corner and wonders what I am and what I would do if it dares to place the next paw down. A slanting spring sunlight has reached every corner of my yard, and the green feeling of all that returns brings me back to a dawn mass in the chapel of the abbey, the morning prayers curling like incense as they rise toward heaven, and a deity the monks believe cannot help but listen. And remembering the, their song in these, the long weeks of our affliction, I do too. Who knows what this is? Yes, it is an owl. A knuckle. It is kind of small. It's a cousin. This is the sole wet owl. W H. Who knew that? Oh, congratulations. That's really nice. you, get a, you get a free. No, you don't. Free owl! Yes! <laughs> Um, I didn't know what it was. However, I was sitting in that same spot where the cardinal came, and uh, it was later at night, and, um, and I, I, well, the poem kind of tells you this, but I heard the sound. I had no idea what it was. I looked over my shoulder, and I didn't see exactly that. What I saw was a wing that flared up like that. And then all of a sudden, it came down, and it took off. This is the last poem. Saw Wet, W-H-E-T. And it's the, is an epigraph from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which says that, explains the name. The name may have come from a call that sounds like a saw being sharpened on a whetstone. <laughs> That's not the sound it makes. That's the sound I make <laughs> when I'm sharpened on a whetstone. <laughs> So wet, you could barely hear it. And when you looked over your shoulder to the roof, tracking the feathery sound, you saw first a small head and a banded body, then the wings that flared, and you could almost see it say to itself, landing here it was a mid-ruffle mistake and a surprise while you, the old inveterate meaning maker, are already thinking, here is the sound death when it comes will make the sigh of someone who has arrived at your door after traveling all night and is glad you are at home and wants a good look to be sure you're the one. Was all this palaver about dying only the easy eeriness of a poem on a humid summer night ripe with ghosts and memory? Maybe this visitor is more like a word that breaks the surface and has come to name the mix of contraries in every feeling. 
Or maybe it is like an image that wonders how it came to take up residence in you. Or perhaps it's a sound barely heard, but real enough for you to know that whatever else it might mean, this is how the next poem might begin. A feather breath of what is small and secretive and near. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for all of the poets and educators. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I would love to hand it over to Phil because this is his. This was his idea. This is his event. I cannot take full credit for this. Um, Phil, would you like to close us out? <laughs> I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> So this was a community effort. And this is what Brockton is about. We are a working class city. But we are artistic as hell. <laughs> we have our poets, our writers, our artists, all here. And what we want to do is bring the recognition to Brockton that it deserves. As I said, we are the city of champions. We are Brockton proud. Thank you all for coming. And we're going to do this again. And I hope everybody comes back. Thank you.